Okay, um, we're going to turn to the book of Acts, and uh, during the last three or four days, the Lord has been laying on my heart um, a few thoughts, and I trust that they'll be a help and an encouragement to you. First of all, is everyone warm enough? Everyone warm enough? Yeah, you're all okay? That's, yeah, no complaints? That's good. Okay, we're going to turn to the book of Acts, and we're going to turn to chapter 1. Acts and chapter 1. Now, this little book is called the Acts of the Apostles, but that's not really a good title. Uh, it's a title that's been placed there by men. We know what they mean, but it's really not the Acts of the Apostles. This is the Acts of the Holy Spirit coming upon the Apostles, and what they were able to accomplish, which was absolutely amazing when you read the book of Acts. It's just so stimulating uh, to your faith uh, to believe that God did this in the early church and that God has not changed. So what I would like to do is to read a few verses, first of all, from chapter 1, and then we're going to read a few verses from chapter 2. We're going to break in, please, <clears throat> at verse 3 of Acts chapter 1. To whom also he showed, that Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion, and by many infallible proofs being seen of them, that's the disciples, forty days. So when Jesus died on the cross and rose, then for forty days afterwards he revealed himself to the disciples. Now there's something interesting about uh, when Jesus rose again, and that was he was only in the company of believers. He didn't reveal himself to the ungodly. He revealed himself to believers. And so we find here uh, there are infallible proofs in verse 3, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus talked to them about the things of God's kingdom. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. So he reminds them of past days, even before he was crucified, that they have to wait in Jerusalem because God the Father has promised that he is going to do something. It's called the promise of the Father. It's the coming of the Holy Spirit. So he reminds them of that, and he also reminds them about the things of the kingdom of God. Those are the two areas where Jesus focuses on with the disciples. Jesus said in verse 5, relating to this um, day of Pentecost, which would come, Jesus said, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized or immersed, submerged with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, and not too many days in the future. That's what will happen. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt uh, thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power or ability, supernatural ability, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, which was their home, and in Judea, which was a kind of a step to the next village, and then Samaria, which was further out, and then the ends of the earth. I want you to notice that when God is working with a Christian or a disciple and maturing them, the first place that you have to show and demonstrate the reality of Christianity is in the home. That's the first place. God said, don't run to the ends of the earth or Samaria, and don't run to Judea, but he said it will begin in Jerusalem. That's the hardest place, but that's where the Lord said, you need this power, because the home is the hardest place. 
And the Bible says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud received out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly uh, toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood, in, stood with them in white apparel, and said unto them, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing? It seems to me that they were there for a period, and who could blame them? I mean, their wonderful Savior, the one that they had loved so much, who had called them, who they had been through so many battles with, who they had witnessed the miracles, they were watching him go, and they were being left behind. And if I had been there, I think I would have had my eyes up as well. So the angel comes and said, Why are you gazing to heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That's the great hope of the Christian, that the Lord Jesus is coming again as he left. And then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And turn with me now to verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Then come with me to chapter 2, please. And we're going to read the first few verses there. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And I'm not going to go into all the details of those people, but I want you to take note of what these people were doing. The, and that's where we're going to look at later on. Verse 11. The people who they were speaking to uh, supernaturally in a language that the people understood. So these were proper languages that these people in the upper room did not know. They didn't know these languages. These people just spoke the local dialect. But suddenly they were supernaturally speaking languages that ungodly people around who were foreigners, they were speaking to them. And what were they speaking? In verse 11, to the Cretes, they were speaking Cretan, to the Arabians, and this is what they were speaking. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Amen, and we know God will bless the uh, preaching and reading of his word. Let's bow in prayer again. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is truth and settled in heaven. And we come to you, Lord, with an awareness of our own utter helplessness and the great need of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we come as weak. We come with no confidence in our flesh, but believing and trusting that the same Jesus that died and rose again has sent the Holy Spirit into the world and he can help us in the same way that he helped the early church and that he is able to undo everything that satan does so we come with absolute confidence in god the father god the son and god the holy spirit we ask lord that you would visit us put a wall of fire round about us Grant your glory and presence in the midst and grant an anointing, Lord. Unstop our ears that we may hear God speaking. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak to you this evening on the coming of the Holy Spirit as in Acts 2, but I want to look at it perhaps from an unusual point of view, not what we're maybe accustomed to when speaking regarding the coming 
of the Holy Spirit. First of all, I want to look briefly at what happened in Acts 2, as I, I'm very aware that many of you will have read and heard sermons and read books regarding Acts chapter 2. It's a very precious and a very wonderful passage of Scripture because it gives us the amazing truth of the coming of the church, the church being birthed, when God supernaturally, by the power of the Holy Spirit, came upon these disciples and infused them with power that they had never experienced before. It was a power that was divine and heavenly, a power that could carry them not only through this particular event, but right through every eventuality, trial, and tribulation of life, and still leave them victorious. That when many of them, who at the end of their life were martyred for their faith, yet that martyrdom was triumphant because they continually had learned to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. This particular day was um, organized in heaven. It was not something that men had arranged. And can I say to you that you cannot arrange the coming of the Holy Spirit? You cannot manipulate and say we're going to have, uh, sometimes we hear of conventions or conferences or, or campaigns and they say God is going to do this or that and come and this will happen and that. Well, unless God supernaturally reveals that to someone, really, you can't do that. That's why the psalmist said, wilt thou not revive us again? In other words, this is from God and he said we need it but it originates with God. It's not in the hand of man. It's not in the hand of the church. But the church can prepare itself. It can make itself attractive to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he comes, and what I want to look at briefly is just some of the things that occurred uh, in the coming of the Holy Spirit on that wonderful day in uh, Acts 2. First of all, we find that there was great unity. We have prayed about that already, and the verse of Scripture that we have quoted from Psalm 133, that where brethren dwell together in unity, there the Lord commands the blessing. Were you ever in a situation where you were conscious that the Lord had commanded the blessing? I remember, I'm sure some of you weary perhaps in some of my illustrations, but uh, they're all I have. But I remember many years ago as a young Christian seeking God and I met with others who were much older and certainly knew a lot more about God than I did. But I can remember those times of prayer. It was very unusual because God really supernaturally brought us together for a period and and he did something during that period, and then it just passed. It was just over. And then we all went on our separate ways. But, but the interesting thing is we all stayed involved to one degree or another in the Lord's work. God really did something supernatural. But, but what I recall, and as I speak to some of those men now, uh, we often in conversation go back uh, to what happened about 30-odd years ago. Because... There were times when we sat and talked together about what God was doing in our lives as we met just maybe four or five of us and as we chatted and prayed and our interest was in the advancement of God's kingdom and that our own spiritual lives would, would move forward. And on occasions, one in particular, but on occasions as we were together in spirit, now we were doctrinally different. Some of us were brethren, some were Baptist, some weren't sure what they were. Uh, there was all kinds of groups. But the interesting thing was, despite our difference theologically, our hearts were united. And, and true unity is not a theological unity. You can differ with a person on issues that are non-essential but yet your heart can be welded together. And it's into that situation that the Lord commands 
the blessing. That's why you should always seek as a Christian to be someone who is pursuing unity. Always attempting not to compromise the fundamental truths of the Word of God, but with the other people of God to have a heart that can overlook the faults of others, that can see beyond the feelings, and can say, well, for the sake of the work of God, for the furtherance of the gospel, uh, let's forgive that person and overlook and go on with God and pray for them as you trust they will pray for you. I often think of a, a, a child. When I was a child, uh, there was eight in my family and we weren't always well behaved. In fact, we were rarely well behaved, to be honest, uh, but certainly at home. But when we were very nasty to one another, and of course I would never have been involved in that, you would know I, was, I would never have succumbed to that. But when we were nasty to one another, my mother would have stepped in. And she would have said, you don't say that to your brother or your sister. Now, if a natural fallen family, that there is that sense from a father and mother that love their children to say, listen, I know you can have difficulties, but I don't want you to treat each other like that. That's, that's too far. I often wonder, what does the Lord think with our behavior with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Well, there was unity. There was one accord, and they were like an orchestra. They all had their part to play. They were all going to be different. Mary wasn't going to preach like Peter, but everybody had their part, and they were happy, and they were in unity. That was a lovely place to be. It's lovely to be in unity with the Lord's people. It's a great blessing. Many Christians have never really experienced it. They have known nothing but conflict and fighting. And what they do is they spend their lives after Sunday going home and spend the week talking about what everybody's fighting about. And that's their week of Christianity. But it's lovely when God can bring you out of that and you can have a genuine love for them and enjoy them and enjoy God in the midst of them. I often say that whenever a church is enjoying the presence and blessing of God, what the people of God do is they talk about God. When God's working, you talk about God. What has God been doing recently? Oh, God has been saving souls. God has touched that life. God has touched my life. But once the Spirit of God draws back from a life or draws back from a church, the people can't talk about what God's doing because God's not doing anything. So what they do is they talk about what each other are doing. And they become a gossip center. And that's often what happens. We can very easily fall into that uh, trap. There was unity. Very quickly, there was divine intervention. Here's the Holy Spirit coming in this supernatural way. Now, what I want you to notice is that when the Holy Spirit came, the apostle, the writer of the book of Acts, Luke, found it very difficult to tell what happened. And that's the way it should always be when they're supernatural. Do you know what I tire of often when I hear testimonies and stories and preaching? Is that it's all too complete. It's all too defined. Everybody knows everything about what happened. I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that. I don't think that's really biblical because there has to be a place for the unknown. There has to be a place in a testimony, there has to be a place for the life of the church where you just step back and say, that was God. I have no other explanation for that. That was God. That was divine. I can't explain that. It happened. It, 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 is, it has occurred, but it was God. And that's the problem that, that Luke had because he said, suddenly there came a sound from heaven, and here's where he has to move away from a supernatural event that happened, an invasion of heaven upon earth, and he can't define it. He's at a loss. So what he has to do is he has to turn to nature to try and explain it. And he didn't say it was a wind that came. He didn't say that it was a mighty rushing wind. He said it was like a rushing 
mighty wind. It was supernatural, but that's the nearest that I can explain it as. It's inexplicable. God filled them. The Bible says they were all filled. Women, men, young, old, not just the pastor and the elders, but they were all filled. The young people were filled. This tongue, cloven tongue, the fire of the Holy Spirit rested on each and every one of them without exception. What was the result of that? Well, the re result was very simple. These people were full of fear. These people had followed the Lord. He had died and rose again. They were thrilled that he was risen. He had gone back to heaven but they had an enemy round about the religious establishment, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priest. They did not want any talk about this man, Jesus. As far as they were concerned, he's dead and gone. He's not resurrected. And there's nobody's going to raise some movement. So these people, it wasn't going like going out with a few tracks to the door. You were going to die for this. So they were all in the upper room and they were locked in and they were full of fear. As one person said, they were devoted, but they were also defeated. And it's very possible to be devoted to the Lord and to be defeated. So what happened? Well, when this, this supernatural event occurred, that they experienced God. They experienced it. Now, I've said to you in point that it was a divine intervention. And why I've said divine is because I could have easily said it was a supernatural intervention, but that would be dangerous to say supernatural because it is possible that you could have a supernatural intervention into your life, even as a Christian, which would not be divine. There are people today undoubtedly in certain churches and situations where they are receiving supernatural events, things that they recognize and confess, this happened to me, but it may not be God. We have to recognize that and to be careful. So they were fearful, but now when the power of God came, they were fearless. They opened the doors. They became very bold for the Lord. And they began to witness the thing that they were terrified of doing. But it seemed as though all the fears that were in them and all the, all the desires within them to save their own lives from what anybody would do on them, it seemed as though that just evaporated. It seemed as though there was such a transformation about them and in them and over them that they became so reckless. And this recklessness was not down to the fact that they were foolish. It was not down to the fact that they hadn't, they weren't a thinking or intelligent people. It was down to the fact that they had experienced the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The power that raised Jesus from the dead in the tomb, that same power had now filled each one of them. And they knew it. And they were being held now and propelled by something they had never, ever known or experienced before. You know, many Christians are, they live in the doldrums. They live in very low places. And sadly, sometimes in churches and fellowships and with other Christians, they are sadly told, well, that's the way it is. You know, you just say, oh, it's good to be saved, but you, that, you know, you just have to. But here in the early church, here in the Scriptures, we have the promise that God, by His Holy Spirit, can fill us. He can take control of us. He can use us in ways that we never dreamed possible. What happened? Well, these people that were speaking to one another, and they spoke about one another, there can be no doubt about that. Before God had come, there would have been undoubtedly a little bit of gossiping, and they were no different to you and I. Some of them would have said, well, Thomas, Thomas let us down big time. See the way he, he said, Lord, unless you show us belief. And you can imagine them, said, Thomas, I mean, he had no faith at all. He's useless. And they would have all had their little comments about each other. But the Holy Spirit coming was to deal with that. 
because now they were not taken up with themselves. See, if you're taken up with yourself, you are not taken up with God or with the Holy Spirit. That's one of the beauties of being filled with the Holy Spirit, because the more the Holy Spirit fills you, the less you will think about yourself. The Holy Spirit will cause you to be fixated with Jesus. You will find your mind and your heart and your affections thinking and meditating and pondering on God. And while you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. What happened was whenever they were filled, their words changed. I love this. Their words change. Because in verse 14, as we read, when they were gone out and... Uh, verse, let me get it for you. Chapter 2 and verse 11. These people said, we do hear them gossip about all the other Christians and what they're doing. It's not there. We do hear them in our own tongue or language, speaking the wonderful works of God. That's what they're talking about. The Holy Spirit is helping them. The Holy Spirit is filling them with words about the things of God. Now, I want you to look at another little verse in, in the book of Malachi. Just move back to the end of the Old Testament, the little book of Malachi. But there's a lovely little verse there and way back about 30 years ago in that very prayer meeting that I'm relating to you, I remember a few of the folk, they used to pray, and there was one man who was Elam, and he used to pray, and he used to quote this verse all the time, and I used to think, that's a wonderful verse. I didn't really know much about it, but, but he used to quote it when we, were, when we were praying together. And in verse 16, look what it says in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Listen, not one about the other. They spake often one to another. Listen what happened when these people who feared God sat together in their homes or sat in a little meeting or whatever it was, they spake one to another. What were they talking about? They were talking about the things of God, the wonderful works of God. They were talking about things that were precious to God. And look what happened when they were talking like that. The Lord hearkened. God took note. Do you know God takes note about what we talk about? And what we talk about to other people can either attract God or repel God. And the Lord hearkened unto them and heard it. So God's sitting at the table listening as they talk one to another about the things of God. And what did God do? He said, oh, that, that was, that's wonderful that they're talking uh, uh, about the things of God. No, no, God went further than that. Look, and a book of remembrance was written. It caused God to write a book as the saints sat and talked about the things of God to one another. God wrote a book before him, and it was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and this is what they did, and thought upon his name. That's what happened in the upper room when the Holy Spirit, they were concentrating on God. They were seeking God in unity. That's what happens. That becomes attractive to the Holy Spirit whenever we're together and discussing the things of God. And I'm sure many of us, I, I would hope most of us, have experienced that to some degree, that on occasions, now listen, we have all failed. I have said things I shouldn't, had to repent. But what I want to say, there, there have been times I can vividly remember over uh, many years when we have sat in the home or sat in a conversation after a mission hall meeting or something and just talked about things that God may have done in our life or God did in past years and you become conscious of the presence of God. 
God coming near, and you feel an inclination to pray. You feel it necessary that you shouldn't leave after the conversation without prayer. It is almost an obligation laid on you by the Lord. You need to pray. You have been in sacred ground. The Lord has drawn near to write his book, and now (coughs) you have thought on his name. And so this is what happened on the day of Pentecost. Now, very quickly. What I want to draw your attention to is is not so much the wonderful thing that happened, but some of the things that happened prior to Pentecost that you and I can learn from. And that is, in chapter 1, I emphasize to you that when the Lord Jesus spoke to the disciples, he said to them, I want to talk to you, and he talked for 40 days about the kingdom of God. Now, that would have been wonderful. Wouldn't you want to have a recorder? to what Jesus had to say about the kingdom of God. Jesus had so much he wanted to tell them about the coming kingdom. He also told them clearly and explicitly that they needed to wait at Jerusalem because this very important event was going to happen called uh, the promise of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and they were the privileged number that were going to be involved, if they had been the generation before or after, they wouldn't have been there. But they had been selected in history to be the very individuals for this hugely important event. But do you know what's shocking about chapter 1? It's almost as though they're not interested. The problem is that when Jesus has done all this, Look what happens in verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, now it means continually, not just once, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Jesus is introducing them to all that God and heaven and the angels are waiting for, and they're totally out of sync. They don't get it at all. They have no real grasp of what God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are attempting to do. Does that ring a bell with you? Why, when I read that, I thought, Lord, that's just me. That is just me. You see, what they were fixated upon was that they wanted the Israel of their day, which was under the rule and the the heel of the Romans, the Roman Empire was dominating all of Israel. They wanted Israel to rise up. They wanted Jesus to become the king, which he will in the future. They wanted him to deal with the Roman Empire. And undoubtedly, they maybe had thoughts, well, I wonder what my job will be. You know, when Jesus takes up king, maybe I'll be secretary of state. Maybe I'll be chancellor, you know. So in other words, these people were believers. God is communicating clearly to them what he desires to do, but they're not getting it. They're not getting it. What's their problem? First of all, their problem is that they are fixated and focused on the material, physical world. They couldn't grasp the nature of the supernatural. They couldn't grasp that. And that's a huge problem for Christians. They can't grasp or understand or or even begin to lay hold on the supernatural. And so what you find is that they often become obsessed with denominations, or with some particular doctrine that fixates, and that takes up their time, and then then if God is not really close to them, gossiping fills up the rest, or a good deal of criticism. And that about makes up their Christian experience. You see, that was these people's problem. The Holy Spirit had to come. Pentecost would have to happen if if they were going to get into line with God at all, if they were going to understand and comprehend the kingdom. So they were taken up with the physical world. God does bless us and can bless us materially. 
Not always, because the Bible says that in, in the book of Hebrews, I think it was, that they, they took the spoiling of their goods joyfully. The Bible doesn't teach that automatically you're going to become a rich person. That's not true. The Bible doesn't automatically teach that you're going to have a brilliant life and that God has basically come to hit you a tap on the back and make you just whiz through life and have no problems and get to heaven and crowns falling on top of your head. There's that many. You'd need a hundred heads to hold them. That's not going to happen. That's not biblical. That's what's taught today, but that's not biblical. If you think, my friend, it's all about being an easy road, well, you need to read Hebrews 11 because it talks about those who followed the Lord, who God sets in the book of Hebrews as the great heroes of the faith, heaven's heroes. And what does it say about them? It says of some of them, they died in faith. They didn't see what God had promised them. Some of them were tortured. Some of them went about the world and they hid in caves and wore, wore skins of animals. They were tormented and weren't fit to be with men. And some of them were sawn asunder. You don't hear a lot about that today in modern TV preaching anyway. It wouldn't, you wouldn't get many sales. I mean, people don't want to give money to something if you're going to be sawn asunder. It's not a good investment. <laughs> But the early church had a power that, that we have not really grasped and certainly not experienced the way we should. Their problem was that they misunderstood what Jesus was saying. You see, they were taken up and confused in their calling. Their calling was to be on the day of Pentecost. That's their moment. Their calling is to proclaim the gospel. That's their, they don't know that's coming. They don't understand that. That's ahead of them. But what they are fixated about is something that is biblical. I mean, these, they weren't talking to the Lord about something terrible. They're talking about the coming of Israel. They're talking about him being king. This is entirely biblical. It's prophetical. But it's in the future. That's not your calling. That's not what you have to be involved in. Do you ever want to be involved in something that God hasn't called you to? You ever want to be, oh, I need to be in that because that's... But did God call you to that? That was their problem. They were fixated with, with the future. Then, of course, immediately after that, uh, what happens is the Lord Jesus ascends before them and slowly ascends up in front of them and goes and then they're standing there. As I said, for ages, they're gazing. The angels have to come and hit them a thump and say, boys, what is that? What is that? Well, here's, here's a little problem, I think, that, that uh, I'm not saying it was as serious as the previous one, but, but this is what I felt when I was studying it, is they, they wanted certain things to stay the same. You know, they, they wanted the Lord, certainly, they wanted to go on with him, but but they didn't entertain or really look forward to the fact that Jesus was going to change things big time. They didn't want that. We want to go on with him, but you see, they had been taken up with the future regarding the kingdom, and now they're taken up with the past. Maybe you're taken up with the future. What you're going to be, what you're going to do. You know, I have to say for many years, my life and thoughts and all was fixated with revival. I don't mind that. But in hindsight, looking back, I sometimes think that I miss things because of my fixation with the future and I forgot the present. And you can do that. And here were people not only fixated with the future, but they're also fixated with the past. And, and you need to let the past go. You need to be willing, if you're going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus, if you're going to walk with him, you have to be willing to let him let things change. You need to be willing to let him make those changes. The disciples didn't find it easy to let the Lord go, but it had to happen. That was God's way. And then they were ushered in to Jerusalem. But thank God when they let the past go, God came. When they made the transitions that they needed both the Lord Jesus to tell them and the angels to prod them to tell them, they did the right thing. And so 
unlike, uh, or rather like every other Christian, certainly myself, they were extremely slow to find and appreciate their calling. <laughs> they were slow. Do you know what's most important? Rather than being fixated about the future or taken up with the past, do you know the best way to walk with God is just each day keep obeying Him. Just simply keep obeying God. Keep your life open to God. Keep your life on the altar to God. And just keep walking with Him and talking to Him. That's the best way. Let's draw to a conclusion quickly. In chapter 1 and verse 14, as I say, this is what Jesus had to contend with. And in chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, they all continued. Now, this is after the angel brought them all together. They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So the beginning of the change, the beginning of the preparation for Pentecost, the beginning of the invasion of this supernatural power that was like a rushing mighty wind, that empowered them to take away all their fear and all their anxiety and all, all the self that they were so full of themselves. And suddenly to be released into freedom, to be bold for the Lord and to speak for him regardless of the consequences, but to discover this amazing supernatural power that enabled them and helped them and protected them. And to essentially walk in a life in the realm of the supernatural. The Bible says of King Solomon, and one of those occasions in the Bible when it says the fire of the Lord fell, there's two or three of them, but the fire of the Lord fell. And it says of Solomon when he dedicated the great temple that when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire of the Lord fell. These people were in prayer in the upper room. I am totally on for, for uh, worship. It's vital. I'm totally on for the preaching of the word. It's essential. But any work and any preacher or pastor or fellowship that have neglected and left prayer aside or set it in the corner, that work will not experience the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Supplication. He's the Spirit of Prayer. And every true awakening, every genuine move of God has always been preceded by earnest, honest prayer. Solomon made an end. I want to tell you a little thing as we draw to the close. I'll not turn it up for time doesn't permit, but you can. 1 Corinthians 15 and 6 when you get the time. You will notice in 1 Corinthians 15 and 6 that when they're talking about the evidence of the Lord Jesus Christ being raised from the dead, that Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time. 500 people Jesus appeared to, Christians. Now here's the problem. 500 people saw Jesus Christ raised from the dead. They saw the infallible proofs of his resurrection. And only 120 were in the upper room. Where were the other 380? They missed it. 120 got it, 380 missed it. Why did they miss it? Let me give you a few examples, and don't worry, we're closing. First of all, out of those 380, perhaps some of them didn't fellowship with God and with his people. In other words, they weren't really serious about walking in the light with God. 
they're a bit like a lot of Christians you meet today. They're on fire today and they're on ice tomorrow. They're all guns for God today and tomorrow they'd eat the head off you. Those type of people. Maybe they were like those. They didn't fellowship with God and his people. They didn't walk in the light. Maybe out of the 380, there were those who were too busy with other things. Just legitimate other things on. I mean, I, I haven't time to go to the upper room and wait for, you know, days. You know, like I have a job. I have children. I remember years ago going to visit a lady and I was really concerned about her and Maybe I was naive as a young Christian, but I was wanting her to go to these meetings because she had a lot of trials and all. And I went in and I said, it'd be really great if you would go to those meetings. Oh boy, I was glad to get out of that house. She took into me. She said, you don't know what it is to have four children and you don't know what it is. Whew. Boy, I thought, I only came to help you. I'm sorry. And I mentioned meetings again to you. I never did. You know, I'm too busy. <clears throat> what did the Lord Jesus say to Peter when he went back to fishing? Got him, got him at the shore, Peter the fish. And what does the Lord gently say to him? Peter, lovest thou these more than me? Remember the late Bill Russell? He was a great help to me. And, 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 and he was a, an old brethren man, but he really loved the Lord. And he used to tell these wonderful stories just of his own experience. And he had become a Christian and he was at the meetings and the prayer meeting. And this night the prayer meeting was coming up and he had a, a sow that was going to have the wee pigs and he thought this, this sow might die, the wee piglets might die, she might kill the pigs, she might sleep on the, lay down on the pigs. And she was so worried and he was down with them. And there he was sitting and was coming near the prayer meeting time. And he thought, you know, I'll have to stay with these wee pigs. And he said, God spoke to him. Now, there are times you have to be sensible. Don't get me wrong. But, but God spoke to him. And God said to him, Bill, lovest thou these more than me? And he said, Lord, I just commit the wee pigs to you. And he said, I went off and I went to the prayer meeting and I come home and she had all the pigs and they were all fine. It was a little test. Maybe some of them were too busy. Maybe some of them were too afraid to join this company. It was risky business to join these people that were radical for God and these people that were going to be maybe persecuted and put to death. Well, I don't want to be in the upper room. I'm glad Jesus rose from the dead and I'm happy to be a believer. I don't want to get into that. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Maybe they had too many problems. You know, it's like Jesus talked about the soil. He said some of the soil was poor because of the thorns that were in it. Remember the thorns? And, and it, ate, it, took, it took the good seed that was growing and smothered it. And Jesus says that's what happens as you mature as a Christian. The cares of the world, the things legitimate, they take over and they kill you. Maybe, maybe they didn't think it was important. <laughs> They'd been to many meetings. They'd been to many gatherings with the saints. What's the big thing about waiting in the upper room? Jesus said, I mean, but you know, we have heard, we know all, I mean, we know as much about Jesus as they do. But Jesus said to go to the upper room, but maybe they didn't think it was important. And they missed it. Many years ago, I went over to Wales to the churches where the revival broke out. A pastor kindly, David Legg and I went over and kindly showed us around these locations and told us things that, that he had known because he was there all his life. And it was very interesting to go to those locations where the Holy Spirit had been poured out in Wales. And 100,000 people were born again. 100,000 in 1904 in Wales. He reminded us that Evan Roberts, from he was a child, when God had saved him, God got a hold of his life. 
that whenever the little boys who were the same age would say, Evan, are you going to play football tonight? Going out in the boat tonight, Evan? No. Why not? Prayer meeting night. Ugh. <laughs> you miss a prayer meeting. No, God might come. And Evan Roberts waited for 13 years. And God did come. Is it any wonder that he was one of the instruments that God used? I don't want to miss what what God has. I'm going to be at the prayer meeting. <laughs> I don't want to miss what God has. The coming of the Holy Spirit. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if in this year that, that God was pleased to work among our hearts and our lives? Wouldn't that be wonderful? And that we would envisage and experience the Holy Spirit coming. I can't think of anything more wonderful that would happen among the Lord's people. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and bless you for the goodness and the love of God and for the patience of God. And Father, we do look to you tonight as a gathering of your people, that you would be gracious to us and that you would pour your Spirit out in this very year that we are in. That, Lord, we would see things that we never dreamed were possible. That we would experience things that we'd never known before. Oh, Father, we place ourselves in your hand. We ask that you would grant to us the same desires that lay on that 120 in that upper room. The same desire for unity. The same desire for prayer. The same desire to seek God. Oh, Father, help us to encourage one another and provoke one another to keep seeking God. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.